Okay, so let us start the uh, final session. The speaker is James Free from uh, Maguire. He will talk about boundary conditions, zero modes, and space-time entropy. So thank you. It's been a, it's a pleasure to be able to come here and talk to you about uh, this work that I'm doing, trying to understand the connections between uh, boundary conditions on one hand and, and how they relate to zero modes, of specifically zero modes of modular Hamiltonians and counting of space-time entropy. So this is some work that's currently uh, in progress with Lampros Lampre. And so my caveat then is that anything you find insightful and rings at the truth probably is due to the wisdom and foresight of my collaborator. And anything that you think you know, is misguided is something that I've sort of slipped under the rug while he wasn't looking. So I'll consider it a success today if I get through my talk and you don't force me to walk back any of my statements. Uh, let's begin with a little bit of motivation. So motivation is trying to understand, it sort of at first at a technical level, what is the structure of the local Hilbert space of a subregion? So here I have you know, my theory defined on some space, and I'm curious about the Hilbert space that I assigned to some subregion A. Uh, we have a lot of tools to study this problem when I have a theory that locally factorizes, that the, the Hilbert space has a tensor product structure. But this is far too naive to understand continuum quantum field theory and continuum conformal field theory because CFTs do not have a Hilbert space that locally factorizes. So what is the right way to think about you know, some Hilbert space HA for my subregion? The sophisticated answer that someone might tell you and maybe is very popular these days is that you should try to understand algebraic quantum field theory and you know, learn about type 3 von Neumann algebras. Uh, but I like to think of myself as a, a simple person with simple tastes. And you know, if, if this person can be with his qualifications can be leader of the free world, then surely I don't need the qualifications of this person to understand the local Hilbert space. And you know, maybe something that these coastal elites don't understand you know, is that I, I've been to the heartland, I've walked down Main Street, and uh, pe people there are nostalgic for a day when you know, uh, an honest person and a little bit of hard work and some linear algebra gives a ticket to the middle class. So I'd like to understand, you know, is there a more populist approach to understanding the local algebra, where I don't need to worry about type 3 von Neumann algebras? So uh, perhaps we can draw inspiration from other simple theories with Hilbert spaces that don't have this local factorization property. And a good example is lattice gauge theory. So here I have a gauge theory defined on the lattice, where I have degrees of freedom that lives on the links. And a basis of gauge invariant operators you might be interested in are the Wilson loops. So here are some Wilson loops a Wilson loop that's closed and lives on a set of links. And what's important about Wilson loops is that they cross the boundary of your region. And so this operator is neither in the Hilbert space I might want to assign to operators in A or in its complement. So we might ask, can we still write a density matrix for observables that actually are localized purely in A? And the answer is yes. And in order to do that, what you find is that the theory decomposes into super selection sectors according to the boundary conditions of our, my region. So my Hilbert, my Hilbert space for my region A has a, the structure of a direct sum over these uh, super selection sectors. And so my density matrix decomposes into some block diagonal structure according to these super selection sectors. So this is the type of structure that I might try to build into my construction of a local Hilbert space uh, in a generic conformal field theory. So what I'm going to do today is show you that by appropriately defining the local Hilbert space for an interval in you know, for today, a 2D CFT indeed will give rise to the structure of super selection sectors. And I hope even more interesting that sort of the technical construction of that Hilbert space is that it has many intriguing properties that result from it. Uh, the first one is that in the dual bulk theory, the super selection sectors are described by bulk membranes that cut our region out from the rest of space time. Uh, well, that's too many. The leading order contribution to the entanglement entropy of the region can be understood to count these membrane states. Uh, the algebra of deformation of these boundary states is an infinite dimensional algebra of approximate zero modes of the modular Hamiltonian. Uh, and this zero mode algebra is precisely the infinite dimensional BMS algebra of this horizon, if that means something to you. I'll explain it later if it doesn't. And lastly, these zero modes give a precise meaning to space-time entropy and resolve some, I think, important paradox that people had brought up and how we assign an entropy to a collection of marginal density matrices describing these subregions. So any question about the motivation or where I'm going to be going? Yes, 
Yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not worrying about fermionic systems here, so let's not get into, I'm going to sort of be very, very naive. Uh, actually, the last thing I should say is they also teach us an important lesson about what, I, how I should define a bulk observable, and this is in a slightly different way than people usually think about it. So, how does a pragmatic person define a local Hilbert space and a density matrix for a region in a 2D CFT? Well, we have to be careful about the endpoints because local operators at the endpoints are not well defined. And the solution is to make a projection onto some fixed state at the endpoints, such that I, you know, I fix the Hilbert space. I don't allow degrees of freedom to live there. Uh, moreover, the entanglement of an interval in the vacuum and in a, you know, a generic state in the conformal field theory is divergent. So I also want to project onto some low entanglement state to cancel some divergences in the entanglement entropy. So I want to project onto some unentangled state that acts both as a cutoff and a boundary condition for my interval. Uh, lastly, in a CFT, it's most natural to insert this projection not along, say, a horizontal cut, but along a circle, because I like to define states on the, on the circle in the CFT. So the particular unentangled states that are used are called boundary or Cardi states, and they define a Hilbert space for this interval. Are, we done knowing about Cardi states and boundary states? Well, not really. The problem is that the boundary states used are, are used as projectors to define a boundary conformal field theory. And the co correlation functions in the boundary conformal field theory are not the same as in the global state. So if I insert these projectors, I insert these states and calculate a correlation function, it will not be the same as a correlation function in the global state. For example, I can think about, oh, I shouldn't point at this screen here, I'll point at this one here. I can think about uh, my boundary CFT living on the upper half plane where this is my sort of boundary of my space time. And you know, I just take, say, a primary operator, and these primary operators will generically pick up one point functions. But primary operators don't have one point functions in the vacuum of a CFT. So it's sort of immediately clear to see that the correlation functions are not the ones that I want. So what I want to try to do then is define a local Hilbert space such that all of the correlation functions, all of these one-point functions, and an arbitrary higher point function will agree with the global state. So it's only an issue for operators very close to this. Right? That's right. So uh, you can see here, for example, that this one-point function vanishes with some power of y, which is the separation from the boundary. So as I take all my correlation functions far from my boundary, there's a factorization property where it's given by the, the global correlator. But I'm really interested in understanding the sort of structure of an exact a Hilbert space for my theory, so I don't want to have an approximate one which will agree in some limit. I want to define a Hilbert space that gives precisely the same correlation functions, not up to small corrections. So uh, in order to do this, I want to talk a little bit more about what it means to put a cutoff on a theory. And I'm going to do that not by talking about a conformal field theory, but just by looking at a simple lattice system. So what does it mean when we use a spatial cutoff to generate a density matrix or calculate entanglement entropy. And we can think about this even if it's not strictly necessary in some finite dimensional lattice system. So consider some state psi. So here I'm defining psi on some number of sites. Here's my state. And I'll have some regions A and A complement. What it means when I insert a cutoff is that I take some state in some region in between the two, and I make some projection onto this sort of unentangled state in the hopes that I've you know, decreased the entanglement entropy. So this is the resulting density matrix. And uh, for this to be sensible, we'd like the insertion of, as we said in the, in the CFT, we'd like the insertion of this cutoff not to have a significant effect on the correlators in A. But it's generically not the case that with this uh, projection inserted to my correlation function, I get the same answer. Unless you know, it, it happens that their mutual information uh, works out to be small. So, to define a density matrix guaranteed to give the same correlators as the global density matrix, uh, it's sort of obvious what one wants to do. You want to sum over a complete set of these projectors. If you do that, then it's like you haven't inserted anything at all. Uh, if you just do this naively, you insert a complete set of these projectors, all you've done is removed your cutoff, right? You get back to the global density matrix all over again. So what we really want to do is not uh, just insert this uh, complete set of states, we really want to perform a measurement. That is, we want to take this complete set of states, entangle, uh, entangle it with our apparatus, and then when we make our measurement, uh, we get this density matrix and not this density matrix. That is, my density matrix has decomposed into some block diagonal form, 
where each block corresponds to a particular uh, measurement outcome. Uh, but an orthonormal decomposition isn't the most general way to perform a measurement, as I'm sure most or many of you know in this audience. More generally, I can think about making my measurement in terms of some POVM. That is, I don't need to have uh, them be orthogonal. I merely need to choose a set of operators that are Hermitian, that are positive, and that are complete. So for example, uh, if I was trying to find a good POVM to make a cutoff in my conformal field theory, it'd be fine to say for to find a set of coherent states. They don't need to be orthogonal. They just need to be some positive resolution of the identity. So uh, just like in the case of lattice gauge, they're the same, imposing a cutoff in this more sort of physical way decomposes our theory into super selection sectors. And we look at the entanglement entropy of this new density matrix for the cutoff uh, theory. Then I find it breaks into two pieces. There's a first piece which is really sort of the classical Shannon entropy, measuring the, the classical entropy of my chosen measurement scheme. And then there's the quantum von Neumann entropy that's measuring sort of the average of the quantum entropy in my different super selection sectors. So to understand how I can implement this sort of very broad schematic structure in a 2D conformal field theory, I need to spend a little more time talking to you about these boundary states that I alluded to before. So boundary states in a 2D conformal field theory are defined by the requirement that no energy flows through the boundary. So the, the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic stress tensors agree on the boundary. And that they produce a well-defined density matrix. So when viewed on the circle, this first condition that no energy flows through the boundary is just given by this condition that ln minus l minus n bar annihilates the boundary state. And the set of states satisfying this condition just this condition alone, not the second one, are called Ishibashi states. And there's an Ishibashi state for every scalar primary operator in the conformal field theory. And they have this structure where it's an infinite sum over sort of level match states in this, uh, in this conformal block. The other, uh, to satisfy the positivity, there's a set of conditions called Cardi conditions. And these are what give me a good density matrix. To understand why that is, I can think about inserting two Ishibashi states on my endpoints. And then I can view this uh, theory as evolving in time in this direction from one state to the other state. And what this gives me is just a Virasoro character. If I view this in the other channel, which is a channel in which this would look like a density matrix along the cut here, I just use an S transformation to map this character into a sum of characters in the other channel. The coefficients here are not generically integers. And so this is not generically a good density matrix. I need to take some sum over characters here in order to get a sum over integer characters with positive integer coefficients here. And so the set of states that satisfy this are a set of states called Cardi states. And they're just some linear combinations of these Ishibashi states. But although we have a collection of Cardi states, they still don't actually span the Hilbert space of the conformal field theory. So for example, I can write the vacuum Ishibashi state as a sum over these good Cardi states. But the vacuum itself is not, I'm not able to write the vacuum itself of this form, just the vacuum Ishibashi state. So to generate a complete set of boundary states, note that the uh, Virasoro is naturally reorganized when we start not from, say, the vacuum state or from primary operator but from a boundary state. So the operators that annihilate the states I'm going to call JM. And these are operators that form their diffeomorphisms of the circle, and they annihilate the boundary states. And then there's an orthogonal set of deformations, which are the orthogonal deformations of the circle. And I'm going to call them PM. So one is just the uh, anti symbol. One is a minus sign, and one is a plus sign. That's the only difference. So these will act on boundary states and generate new states. This is the algebra of these operators. Well, before, you know, the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic uh, Virasoro algebras uh, commute with each other. Here they don't commute. And so instead of a product of these two symmetry groups, I have a semi-direct product where they, you know, one generates an automorphism of the other. So uh, we can use these generators PN that are the orthogonal deformations of my boundary states to generate any state in the conformal family of the Ishibashi state. So for example, there exists some 
uh, infinite sum, some infinite linear combination of, you know, here excitations or descendants of the vacuum Ishibashi state that is the vacuum state itself. Now, you might think that these are going to be a nice set of states that I can use to define a complete set of boundary conditions, but that's not quite true. That's because they don't give positive operators. They're a little too orthogonal from each other. So you might think I take some excitation of one boundary state on one end and some other boundary state on the other, and then I, you know, I can look at their, the supposed partition function they would generate, and it vanishes because these states are orthogonal, and so they're not positive. Somehow they have positive and negative eigenvalues that sum up to zero. So the proposal that I'm making is that we can form a POVM by acting with all operators that are not just these infinitesimal deformations, but some exponentiated infinitesimal deformation. And I give these some chosen scale small, some chosen small scale epsilon. So I can think of these as all the states that are the form. I take my boundary state on some circle, and then I just wiggle it by some finite but very small amount. And I can you know, choose this amount to be as small as I like. Any questions about what I've said so far? Yeah. Pardon? It's just the conformal transformation of that condition, right? So you could do a conformal transformation that map this to be flat again, and in that frame, there's, you know, t of z is equal to t bar of z bar. And now this is just mapped to some other cut. So rather than go into the details of generating a POVM from all of these generators, what I want to do is now just assume that this forms a complete set of boundary states, and I want to look at how they appear in the bulk gravitational theory. So what is the gravitational description of our super selection sectors? Well, the gravitational dual of the boundary state is believed to be a brain of one higher dimension uh, that gives a boundary to the space-time. So just like the boundary state gives some boundary to the CFT, the boundary brain gives a boundary to the gravitational theory. So here, you know, if I have my two-dimensional conformal field theory and some boundary that lives here, the bulk picture would have some brain emanating into the gravitational geometry. And if I take, you know, my interval lives here, and if I put two little boundaries that circle the endpoints that are meant to be my cutoff, then I have two little sort of hemispherical brains in my gravitational theory. And if I kind of slice it, what it looks like is they've cut out these little spheres about the endpoints. Ah. But the, the density matrix for a region in the conformal field theory is meant to describe something that's called the entanglement wedge. That is, there is uh, a region of the gravitational geometry that's meant to be described by this density matrix. And so it'd be nice, rather than having some brain that cuts out some region about the endpoints, it'd be nicer to have a brain that cuts out the rest of the gravitational geometry and just leaves me with some region connected to A. That is, it's not cutting out little bits, but it's cutting out the whole rest of the space-time except the part that's meant to be described by my density matrix. So, uh, you know, this is kind of, in, in the bulk picture, the entanglement is between degrees of freedom that are in this wedge and outside, and so it would be nice if then this is sort of separating those two sets of degrees of freedom. Uh, that is, uh, yeah, that's what I said. So can we use boundary states not to cut off the theory at the end point, but really sort of to cut the theory off in scale? So here is a non-standard, but to me seemingly fine way to cut off an interval in a CFT. Instead of putting the boundary state at the endpoints, I'm going to circle my interval with the boundary state. And so this is much more like instead of cutting off the, the theory in scale here, sorry, in position here, I'm cutting off the theory in scale here. Uh, as the standard boundary states themselves have no spatial entanglement, these states are, have, you know, they're locally a product state, uh, this cutoff itself then just gives a product state. Uh, I do expect that the perturbed states will generate some subleading contribution to entanglement between the two halves. Uh, but now, maybe not so, well, now the leading order entanglement is coming entirely from counting these states of brains rather than the quantum entanglement between the two sides. Uh, you might think it's not surprising. What I've essentially done by projecting my theory here is made a complete measurement on the complement. 
you know, projecting here is equivalent to sort of projecting along the rest of the CFT outside of my interval. And of course, if I make a projective measurement on the entire rest of my system, it's not surprising that, you know, at least at leading order, that what I'm getting is a whole bunch of unentangled states that's sort of designed to do that. This is a CFT picture. This is the, here I'm just looking in this plane here is the 2D CFT uh, Euclidean plane. Here is my interval. And now I've circled my interval with a boundary state. Okay, and you're defining a, okay, you're defining a density matrix on? I'm defining a density matrix on my the interval yellow, A. The yellow is an open cut. The yellow is an open cut, okay. yeah. Okay. And because on this red line I have no spatial entanglement, and then I just evolve the two sides separately. Uh, I have no, uh, there's no entanglement in this projected state between the top and bottom half. That is, my state is in a product state. That was not the case before. So when I, because there I just projected out some little cutoff around the endpoints, and so there's large amounts of entanglement that are generated by the connectivity of my Euclidean path integral. Well, what I'm trying to argue is that this is a cutoff now not in position, but in scale. Um, it's a good, I mean, well, as you take these circles larger and larger, I mean, there probably is, but it'd be very singular. And some, as I say, you know, the thing that it's sort of, uh, well, so topologically equivalent to is taking your two boundary circles and then make them cover the rest of the, the CFT. Is there, I mean, so there must be some conformal transformation that then relates that to this circle, but I think it'd be very singular. Is there anything going on at these endpoints? Well, here there, I, there is no entanglement in, in this boundary state because it's completely uh, spatially disentangled. That's what the boundary states do. No, but the, there's a single red circle, right? That's right. There's a state. One state on that whole red circle. That's right. So that doesn't entangle the two. No. So if you were to look on this red circle and look at any region and look at its entanglement entropy, it would be zero. And now I'm going to perform some evolution on each side independently. So you still have the sum over boundary condition. I took the sum over boundary condition. So my point was in that by making this, by doing a projective measurement on the entire complement. I've now translated all of my entanglement entropy into classical Shannon entropy of that projection. That's right. So this is the leading contribution. And then there is a subleading contribution, which is going to come from the deformations of these brains. And these should generate a quantum. Pardon? So I'm summing over, well, this gives me a density matrix, but reproduces all correlators of the CFT. Well, uh, I, I mean, this density matrix has some very, well, some infinitely large number of super selection sectors that I've formed by projectively measuring. I mean, when, when, you, when you take a density matrix for a region, you, you know, you, let's think of like a finite system. You trace over the complement. There's absolutely nothing wrong, though, with taking each of those, you know, each term in that uh, sum over the complement where you trace and just separating them out and treating them like super selection sectors. That will give the same answer. You don't, you can put them on top of each other or keep them separate. It's, they, they give the same correlation functions when you do it appropriately. Oh, no, I'm saying it, it gives exact, this gives a density matrix which produces, reproduces correlation functions exactly. That's my but claim. you were saying something before about leading order? Oh, I'm saying that uh, the, there is no von Neumann contribution to the entanglement entropy at leading order because this boundary state is factorized. At leading order in what? Um, well, in this, these epsilon deformations are going to generate some small amount of entanglement, right? So my, my, 
Virasoro generators do not act independently on the top and bottom, and so they're going to add some entanglement to my boundary conditions. That's right. Yeah, and it, it well, I mean, it's probably more than that in that uh, I'm not using uh, orthogonal projectors. These are really some sort of set of coherent states. And so I may have actually many, sort of many copies of the diagonalization. Okay, that's why, I, that's. An orthonormal basis. No, oh, okay. I'm not using an orthonormal, that's why, well, I probably rushed to the beginning, but I made the point of saying that when I, when I, form boundary conditions and a cutoff by making a not, I make it doing a POVM. And so more generally than just an orthogonal projection, I should think about that as being some, uh, some, some POVM, which can be defined by a collection of positive Hermitian operators who sum to the identity. So but even, this, even though you get the correlation functions right, you don't get the entropy quite right. Yeah, so this entropy can be, I mean, this entropy can be sort of different than the entropy that you're expecting. Um, and actually, I haven't, calculated the entropy in this picture because there's still some technical subtleties that uh, you know, haven't been fully understood. Well, no, so the Cardi states were all of the conformally invariant boundary conditions, and now I said take the orthogonal deformations that generate the, re the rest of the uh, conformal block. And those aren't conformally invariant. They, they transform under conformal transformations. Okay, let me continue. Um, so, our new boundary conditions will have precisely the form we desired in the bulk. So now my boundary is dual to some uh, spherical brain that covers the region, sort of homologous to my boundary region. And when I cut it, it'll have some interior region and some exterior region. And so it has cut off my, the space time around A from the rest of the space time. So I want to talk a little bit about the algebra that describes the deformations of these membranes. So let's take a closer look at these symmetry generators. So I required that we only make infinitesimal deformations. So I want to define new uh, Virasoro generators of these PNs where I've rescaled them by some epsilon, and I'll call them PN tilde. So this was the original algebra. And this is the rescaled algebra, where I'm only allowed to make these very small deformations. So you'll see what's really changed is that these PN operators, well, here they uh, didn't commute with each other. Here now, at leading order, they commute. And that's the important fact. Uh, so things that I want to note about this, the modular Hamiltonian is really generated by some of these PNs. And so all of these generators are really, it's an algebra of approximate zero modes of the modular Hamiltonian. So to you know, leading order and epsilon, these are zero modes. and this algebra here is the BMS3 algebra of a Rindler horizon in three dimensions. So the natural reorganization of the conformal algebra and the rescaling that gives you these zero-mode deformations of the brain results in the BMS3 algebra. So what is the BMS3 algebra? Let me tell you in 30 seconds. This will be an entirely insufficient introduction, but maybe it'll be uh, nice to look at the pictures. So one might have thought if you take some, say, Rindler wedge of flat space, uh, that the, the zero modes, the symmetries of this Rindler wedge, are given by the global symmetry generators that can meet with the Rindler Hamiltonian. So here is my flat space. I, here I divide it into two Rindler wedges. And you know, I might have thought the symmetries were simply the Rindler time translation and the Rindler space translation. Uh, but in fact, if you cut your space time along a null sheet, so here I take my space time along this null direction, and I separate it into two pieces, I can ask, what are all the possible ways that I can glue it back together again? And there's actually a large amount of freedom in how we glue it back together. So here's this V direction, and here is some orthogonal direction to the plane I've shown you up here. You know, a global symmetry generator would just be gluing it back by taking, say, this upper yellow half and shifting it ahead a little bit and gluing it back together. But in fact, what you can do is take some arbitrary choice of deformation in your gluing. So that is, when I glue the two halves, I take the V coordinate of one and the v-coordinate of the other, and I glue them back together, but shifted by some arbitrary function of this orthogonal direction. Uh, these, uh, ortho they, these position-dependent deformations along this orthogonal direction are super translations. Uh, they're equivalent to having some sort of inhomogeneous shock wave that travels along this null sheet. 
So if you were to solve Einstein's equations with this deformation in it, what you would add is some amount of matter that lives on the null sheet joining these two halves of space together. Um, with respect to the modular Hamiltonian of one side, the super translations are zero modes. Uh, and if we decompose these super translations into the Fourier mode, so instead of looking at the position dependent function, I just look at their Fourier modes along the sheet, I get the same BMS algebra that we found earlier. So any questions about BMS algebra before I continue? Pardon? Oh, um, C prime, well, I mean, in, in the BMS algebra, C prime is meant to be related to the gravitational coupling in the theory. Uh, in my, in, in the way I realize it, it's epsilon times C, yeah. I, I don't, I, I'll tell you, I don't, I don't think I fully understood exactly what we should think about uh, this scaling. I think that's an interesting question to think more carefully about what that means. But what's nice about understanding the connection between my algebra of the brain deformations in BMS is it gives sort of an, a nice new way to think about uh, the counting of this entanglement entropy. So uh, we can think of the Rutakanagi area formula of entropy as arising from counting you know, shock waves along the boundary of our entanglement wedge. So this is the same picture of this algebra, this deform, this algebra of brains that I had before, but now I'm understanding it as the algebra that's counting along uh, the boundary of my entanglement wedge, all the possible shock waves that I can insert that are just sort of these different gluing functions that glue the outside and the inside together with some super translation shift. Don't know how much time I have left. Let me just, oh good, we're doing good. So, uh, I'll, I'll say that the connection here is maybe more clear Actually, let me skip this comment in order to move along. Uh, uh, it's believed that, so this is sort of some nice way to think about the entanglement entropy and its connection to some area of some Rutakanagi surface in the bulk, but it's also believed that you know, all, most, or many areas in space-time have an entropic explanation, not just the, the Rutakanagi surface that gives entanglement entropy. So how do we see this in ADS-CFT? Uh, one partial explanation was differential entropy. In differential entropy, you try to say, you know, here I have some region I've cut out of the middle of my space time. It's not some entanglement wedge describing entanglement entropy. And I want to think about its area as an entropy. And so maybe I should think about each little tiny increment of area along its surface as being sort of some contribution from the entanglement of some region that is just sort of touching it. So it's some entropy that I associate to the region A, which I associate to the entropy of this hole in space-time. Um, and so to put this together, one can think here, I'm going to take this picture and I've sort of stretched it out in this direction. So here is one of these surfaces that touches it. Here is the entanglement entropy of that first interval A1. And I can, you know, add the entanglement entropy of some nearby one and then subtract the entanglement entropy of their intersection and it leaves some contribution, which is just this part here. And I keep iterating this process. I add the entanglement entropy of the next region and subtract an intersection, and it leaves me some little bit here. And I keep repeating that process, and I get you know, some sort of differential contribution of the surface that is tracking the area of this hole that I've cut in my space time. So this was sort of a, a differential entropy approach to trying to understand uh, the entropy I associate to this region. Uh, but the meaning of the differential entropy, I think, was initially unclear. That is, there's no identification of entangled modes in my region A with some specific part of my Rutakanagi surface. One hope was to you know, appropriately assign some entropy to a collection of marginal density matrices. That is, a differential entropy is meant to take all of the uh, de uh, density matrices describing regions that don't cross this circle and then, you know, give them an entropy. So perhaps it was meant to be some entropy of consistent global density matrices with all these marginals. So it was all of the global density matrices where if I traced over the complement of these regions, I got back the density matrix for that region. But I think uh, BMS horizon super translations and these boundary conditions give the clearest picture. So 
instead of thinking about Fourier modes of our super translations, we just work in a position basis. And so there's a particular super translation that corresponds to some differential element on my surface. And I can add all these together. And I have a set of super translations which are just telling me about the, the, the shock wave that I have that is the gluing condition between the inside and outside of this region. So I think there's now a clear counting that associates the BMS modes that live along the boundary of this region with the entropy of that hole in spacetime. Um, but there's an apparent tension with this desire that I mentioned to associate differential entropy to some collection of marginal density matrices. So this was an argument by Brian Swingle and Isaac Kim. Uh, and here's a little thought experiment they put forward. Take the ground state of the CFD and cut some hole in it. Uh, and now consider the collection of density matrices that describe regions that don't cross this hole. Uh, at every point on the boundary, it lies in the interior of one of these regions. And now I can compute the stress tensor using this density matrix. And if I measure that the stress is zero everywhere, then I know the expectation value of the Hamiltonian is zero. And if the ground state of my CFT is unique, then this state is uniquely determined by all of these marginal density matrices. That is, the you know, ability to measure energy exactly on the boundary means there's no such thing as a collection of consistent density matrices. So what gives? Well, the mistake is thinking that space-time entropy is related to CFT observers and their measurements. You know, space-time entropy is related to gravitational observers and their measurements. So the entropy that I'm talking about counts BMS super translations. BMS trans super translations indeed change the energy of the state, and they're detectable by measuring the CFT stress tensor. But they are also approximate zero modes of the modular Hamiltonian. And so no finite time observer in one of these little Rindler patches can measure the presence of these modes. That is, no finite time bulk observer can measure the true CFT stress tensor. You know, if we were to decompose a stress tensor in terms of Rindler modes, it will have non-zero overlap with the zero modes of that modular Hamiltonian. And so this understanding of differential entropy and space-time entropy is much closer to the, I think, the original thought experiment behind the proposal, where you're meant to associate entropies to a collection of observers who are unable to, you know, they're accelerating observers who don't enter this region of the space-time. And so now we're directly associating the entropy not to the sort of direct CFT stress tensors, uh, but to the physically realizable finite time measurements of a collection of gravitational observers. And so, you know, if, if you wanted to take the philosophy of assigning the entropy to a collection of density matrices, it shouldn't be to the collection of marginal density matrices to, for my regions A, but I need to trace over these zero modes. I need to throw out that information. And so now there are many global density matrices consistent with my collection of marginals. Uh, it's important to note that, you know, local CFT operators, as I was saying before, cannot be commuted using these zero-mode reduced density matrices. And so rather than trace out the zero modes, you might just want to think about, uh, make sure the operators that we're working with in the bulk are invariant under the actions of these zero modes. That is, a true gravitational observable in this sense should be one that's left invariant by acting with all of my symmetry generators. That is, gravitational observables associated to some given region of space-time should be gauge invariant observables when we treat this conformal group or BMS super translations as a gauge transformation. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and as a summary let me just put up uh, these facts that I said at the beginning and repeat them here for you and I think I'm out of time so maybe I'll just leave them up here on uh, the display and go to questions. So thank you. Thank you very much. So it's time for questions. So going back to the CF, just the CFT story, um, is it true that you, your method kind of defines a 
new set of entanglement of measures of entanglements that one can associate with a state of a CFD? Yeah, I think you could phrase it that way. Okay, uh, so it's it's it, like you're targeting some extra, you know, sort of coherent states uh, around the entangling points, right? Around the entanglement edges. I mean, I'm not. I guess it uh, depends what you want to think about. I'm not sure I'm adding anything so much as just you know decomposing my state in some basis. Okay. Um, okay. And my final question is: Can you do this for non-CFTs? I mean, I I haven't thought about that. I, I mean, I think these this philosophy should extend quite generically. Any other questions? Oh, the point five, you say the zero modes give a precise meaning to space-time entropy. What, what does it mean that exactly? Is, is finite, is a number, or what? what yeah, that? well, what I'm saying is that I should think about the entropy that I assign to some you know, arbitrary region of space-time as an entropy counting the BMS super translations uh, that glue that region to the rest of the space time. But and that, I can think about those. Is it still infinity or not? Pardon? Is it still infinity or, or is it not? I mean, yeah, so these entropies still are going to diverge. But you know, this area is finite. I mean, yeah. I mean, so there are still some technical obstructions to actually summing these up and counting them. So it's a good question about whether or not you can truly get a finite result out. That's, that's certainly something that needs you, to be. You say that the, in general the situation is, is an, as in holography where the area is finite, but you have divergence in the infrared or the, the boundary or something that's like that? That's right, yeah. That so kind of situation? It, it's Do you think question. the same situation happens for other theories that are not holographic? Or, or, or this is only holographic? No, I mean, I think these divergences should be generic. Do you have in mind some maybe some Cardi formula like computation of this BMS algebra gives some entropy? Or you have in mind totally different computation? Pardon? I mean, so if we would derive some uh, black hole entropy, we can use some Cardi formula to estimate degeneracy, mm -hmm. right? So do you have in mind something like this for BMS algebra? Or you have in mind so different? I haven't thought about it that way, so I don't know. In that case, is we get a finite number anyway. For yeah, that's, it's a good question. I'm not sure. Mm. Any more questions? This is the last question. So to go back again to the CFT story, you did this sort of smeared states. Yes. And is there any just sort of CFT way to check that this is gives you the kind of states with the properties you want? And let me make one, yeah, one relation is there was a paper by Cardi recently where he was talking about, I think, very similar, maybe identical smeared states, smeared boundary states to be a ground state of a CFT, and at least there were some checks he could do to see that that yeah. made so sense. I and think in this case, he was only smearing them by using the Hamiltonian. Right. In that case, it's obvious because you're just changing the modular parameter, and so it's clear that when you look in the other channel, you still get a, you know, a sum of positive integer coefficients. Yeah. Right, I mean, but I mean, but then could you extend, I mean, so yes, you yeah, so much more general, could you sort of follow that philosophy right. and then, and no, then that, check that's, explicitly? That's exactly right. So there's, a, there's a, just a technical calculation to do in the CFT to explicitly check that all of these deformations are, uh, give you a good you know, partition function in the other channel. And it's just one that we haven't finished yet because there's, yeah, anyway, okay. we, we don't know how to finish that calculation right now and didn't do, finish it before this conference began. So okay. yeah, it's worth doing. Okay, so let's just thank the speaker again.